So I'm going to start this off with a classical, a classic philosophical question. Do we really need more fonts? <clears throat> and so recently we, we launched uh, Future Fonts, which is a platform for selling in progress typefaces. Um, and so this kind of, uh, we, we kind of start, started to change this question into, do we really need more fonts that are incomplete and probably have mistakes? Um, and so we, we really started to question whether or not what we're doing is, is a good thing to add to the, to the industry. Um, is it going to um, just add a lot of noise to an over, already overcrowded uh, type industry? Um, should, we, should we be putting this out there? Um, and this is like all before we even launched and uh, just kind of going into this like anxiety feedback loop. Um, and I think that um, any creative kind of goes through this when you're, when you're putting yourself out there and making yourself a little bit, uh, a little vulnerable. Um, and it's just, it's really, really scary to, to release uh, any kind of new creative project. Um, <clears throat> And, and every time I, I release a new, a new typeface, like I'm always like terrified that somebody's gonna notice my horrible spacing and start an angry Twitter mob. And my career's gonna be over and I'm gonna have to try to figure out something else to do with my time. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, and so I, I think that when, when, you get, when you get pushed back and you st really start to get scared, um, you, you end up taking less risks and, and you, you tend to stay in your safe zone a little, a little too much. The problem, like Trav said, was the problem with being scared is that you stay in your safe zone. And as creatives, it's really important to take risks because by taking risks, growth happens faster. Um, and when you take risks and try something new, it's super scary, but, and the problem is it's probably prone to more mistakes. So with Future Funds, we wanted to try to create a safe place for mistakes to happen and to try new things, experiment, explore. And um, I mean, the, cut, the idea actually came, Trav, we were working on this brand typeface called Kicker. And it was for Design Week Portland. And six years later, we had an agreement with them that we could release it on our own and sell it. And six years later, we still hadn't released the typeface. We didn't feel like it was quite ready for a commercial release, whatever that really means. Um, in the meantime, we had launched three different versions of the websites with numerous updates and fixes and tweaks. Um, so it kind of sparked the idea. And we were just gonna do it on our own personal website as like a lab kind of thing. And then we started asking friends in the industry and getting, seeing if they thought this was kind of a useful, positive thing for the community. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, like as, as we were making this, we kind of were like keeping a, a bunch of different um, different ideas in our in our mind, and some there were some like interesting uh, uh, other conclusions that we kind of realized, like after seeing this out in the wild, um, that are really important to creating that safe place where you can take those risks and and fail in a safe in a safe way. Uh, the first thing is that uh, mistakes do not necessarily imply carelessness. Uh, and so with every project that we take on, like we, we put all of our effort into it, all of our heart, um, and we really, really want to do the right thing and, and make great work. But we, we make a lot of mistakes. Uh, like we're all human, um, and mistakes are just going to happen. And and even if you're aware of them, like we're aware of a lot of mistakes in, in our work, and. Um, but because of priorities of maybe it's budget or timing or maybe the amount of effort that's required to go in and, and make those changes uh, to make it perfect, um, it just might, not, your priorities might li not line up. Um, but the important thing is that just uh, like as you're viewing work or as you're putting work out there, be, be okay with making a mistake and it doesn't mean that you're necessarily careless. and. Uh, and, and really early on, we, we realized that intent is everything. And if we're uh, on future fronts, like having this place where we're selling tight faces that, are, that have mistakes and have problems, um, <clears throat> we realized that it, it was important that people knew what they were getting and that the, 
it had to be transparent, the, the state of the typefaces, and that when it had problems, people knew about them, or if there were certain parts of the project that needed more work, or, or what you were intending for the, the final, um, final character set, or whatever it is. It's important that people know about those, and um, that they're not surprised when they, when they purchase a license and, and load it up, and, and there's something wrong with it, or there's something missing. Um, and so it's, and I think that the, the interesting thing that's happened is that when you, that we've noticed is that when you make yourself a little vulnerable like this and like you're transparent and honest, uh, I think people start to realize that there's a real person behind, behind these typefaces that are making, uh, that are toiling away and struggling and trying to make this, this beautiful typeface. And, and I think that people want to help and, uh, and when we were really kind of scared of like a lot of uh, a lot of trolls and a lot of like unconstructive feedback, and and it seems like people want to help and they're they're excited to help, and 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 point out the ways that it could be better and and to help you get there, and so I think there's an interesting connection between the the uh, the, the creators and the users uh, when you're transparent about things. And a lot of type design users are designers themselves, graphic designers, and using typefaces. Um, and so exposing the creative process and what you're thinking, um, they can understand and they can work with it. And it might make the whole process a little more approachable and less intimidating. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make this transparent, not overwhelming for both the, the type designer and the graphic designer. Um, and how do we kind of make it like a, a, ga a bridge that gaps the uh, the distance between the two. And so we're like, well, we can make it, like, how do we make it scannable so it's not overwhelming, taking cues from GitHub and Kickstarter and the current landscapes of UI and terms that people are using so it doesn't feel intimidating and can actually be a positive to help educate users, designers, how to use typefaces and what goes into what, what designers are thinking about when they create the typeface um, and putting a little more of their own personal voice into the project. Um, so both thinking of the type designer, how they would express it, and like progress bars, visual icons, stuff like that, but also for the graphic designers using the typefaces, not hiding the fact that these are works in progress, celebrating it, making it clear on the homepage, even on the checkout, like an opt inbox. Who loves an opt inbox? No one. <laughs> but just like making sure they understand this typeface is a work in progress. And like celebrating some of the cues that Instagram, people are posting work, works in progress and it's celebrated and a lot of the times, me included, I'm like, oh, I would love to use that for a project. So kind of like taking the energy that's going on today and making it transparent, making it that connection and starting the conversation between the, the users and the type designers. So another thing I think that's really important to, to keep in mind as you're um, working on anything creative is to make sure that you know your audience. Um, so recently there was uh, an interesting qu Twitter conversation going on. The question was, what's uh, something that should be obvious but your profession seems to misunderstand? And Kai Bernal responded by saying, you're not designing for other designers. And then Chris Sowersby responds to that, taking it a step further, you're not designing typefaces for other typeface designers. And so I'm definitely guilty of this. And a lot of my anxiety in releasing typefaces, I think, comes because I'm worrying about the wrong people. Like, I, I want to make the, the peers in, in the industry uh, and all my friends, I, want, I don't want to disappoint them. And, and I know that uh, the type designers are looking at things with uh, really detailed eyes. And they're, they're noticing the flaws in that stuff. But at the end of the day, I think we need to remember like who we're designing for and try to make sure that we're valuing their goals. Like those are the goals that we should be trying to solve. Like I think there's a lot of overlap there. Like you should definitely be I think it's you we all want to be doing good work. And and I think that uh, thinking about what other type designers are thinking about is important and it helps push you and it helps push the industry forward. But make sure you're not losing sight of the fact that um, that they're probably not going to be the ones that are using your typefaces. The other um, area a lot of anxiety comes from for us is let's stop releasing these fonts like they're cast in metal, that they're super precious, that we can't fix them on the fly. 
Um, we grew up or in the digital age and use web all the time. And one of the things I love about the web is if there's a spelling mistake, if you want to switch out the color, you can do it. And the internet makes that really possible. Um, and so fonts are software, and so start taking cues from some of the software in industries, like launching, it's called an MVP, the most valuable products, and then strategically launching additional features, and, and it's also an opportunity to highlight those features and educate the designer on how to best use the typeface, where I think when you launch it all at once, it can be overwhelming to use and they might not understand or even know what features are available to them because so many things are highlighted. Um, yeah, so kind of just shortening that loop and remembering, oh, and, and using it as an opportunity, as another opportunity to market the typeface, I think has been very valuable in releasing it in stages. The other question that we had is what does finished even mean? Who is determining this? Do we have to determine it as an industry? Can it be boundary-based? Can it be on the individual typeface? Like, I guess we kind of define it as a usable, something usable for the designer, um, but that could vary. And so kind of questioning, like, what is this big character set that we're all striving for? What is the exact space? Like, does it have to be perfect? Can we launch it sooner? Can we change this definition a little bit? So full, full disclosure, um, I really just put this slide in here because I think it looks amazing set in Cooper. <laughs> and, and I hope that he makes a t-shirt out of this, maybe with, uh, with those iron-on felt letters or something like that. <laughs> um, but seriously, um, as we're trying to create this, uh, this creative community, it's important that we as members in it, whether it's on Future Fonts or on Twitter or on Instagram, when somebody's putting their work out there and, it, and maybe it's finished or maybe it's uh, a work in progress, let's make sure that the, the discussion around it is, is constructive. And so if you see problems with it, uh, that's great and, and help them get better. And, and at the end of the day, remember that we're all part of uh, that same community trying to help each other get better and that uh, we're going to grow a lot faster if we're helping each other get better rather than tearing them down. And, and I think that it's uh, also important to realize that, um, they may, that you might not fully understand going back to that intent, like try to understand what the, their intent and their goals are with the project and to try to help them get to those rather than what you think is a great typeface or a great project. Um, and, and I think that's really important as we try to reach out and broaden the, um, broaden the industry a little bit and bring in different viewpoints, uh, that there are, there's more than one way to create uh, a great typeface or a great website or a great whatever it is that you're making. <clears throat> So back to the original question, do we really need more fonts that are incomplete and probably have mistakes? Need is a loaded word, and in this current world political landscape, I don't know. But I, I do think that these typefaces have value. And um, the hope is that by taking risks and creating an environment that allows for creative explorations, that interesting things will happen, that designers will grow, new designers will come, there will be new voices, people will be excited about type design, and um, that it will help the industry grow as a whole, and hopefully quicker. And we're already starting to see some cool things. I mean, they're not things that aren't happening elsewhere, but they're just interesting examples of um, type design happening today, or conversations that we've that have come up. So Chi, one of our, our partner in Future Fonts, James Edmondson, created this typeface Chi. Um, he runs Ono Type. And I think it's a really interesting example of variable font because it's not only changing the weight and making that, uh, having micro controls of that, but as you change the typeface, it's actually changing the style and the design of the typeface. And so it makes it really customizable on how you want to express your brand. Um, but still feels coherent and in the similar family. And so I think it's a really, and I think graphic designers are really excited about it. And then we've also been doing like animation promos and so they're starting to realize that variable fonts can also be a way to promote, to do animations on the web and in marketing materials. But I think the style, using variable fonts to change the style was an interesting use of variable fonts. Nostra by Lucas. Decroix. <laughs> um, also, I think this is interesting because he challenges what's normally de 
defined as a typeface family. Um, they're both monospace, but wildly contrasting styles. Um, but somehow they match and they fit together. So I think by just like challenging some of the existing terms is interesting as well. Um, and so ways to challenge technology I think is interesting, ways to challenge current existing terms and um, norms in the type industry I think is interesting in this experimental model. And I think we're also seeing typefaces that have really interesting designs because I think typefaces that take a really long time to release might be different styles than typefaces that have quicker releases and might tap into design trends that are happening at quicker at now. Um, and so I think there's value in that and we're seeing a lot of really interesting designs that I think graphic designers are excited to use as branding and artwork. So to recap, and also squeeze in a few more future fonts that we love, make sure you scare yourself, <clears throat> take some risk, listen to those in the community around you. You don't have to do what they say, but just you know, listen, consider it, and figure out how you want to react to it. Make sure you're having a little fun. Not everything has to be uh, solving some uh, some serious and crazy need, although those, there's plenty of room for that still. <clears throat> get a little bizarre, and hopefully you'll get somewhere unexpected and grow as a designer and help push the industry forward. Thanks. Thanks. And if you... <laughs> And if you want to follow along, we're like the launching new designers and new typefaces and updates on Instagram. That's kind of where. And there's posters outside and stickers too. <laughs>